Happy Father's Day to everyone. It's really great to have some fathers with us who are visiting for the first time. We're actually in the middle of a series in the letter to the Philippians, and Paul has already kindly led us in prayer, so I'm going to begin and ask you to open up your Bibles to page 981, um, because we'll be referring to that passage. I do have with me this morning some previous year presents from my children from Father's Day. I have this great piece of artwork from my youngest son, which is a photo of himself (laughs) with some nuts and bolts in superglue around the frame. Very artistic, this child. And then uh, I have more characteristically from my daughter, a whole heap of love hearts, as you can see. And uh, I love you, Daddy. Isn't that nice? (laughs) And then... uh, Then uh, I have to say my favorite, don't tell the children, but my favorite, not child, but piece of artwork is North Sydney Bears. Can you see that? (laughs) The bears are back, if you're wondering, they are back. And this is a piece of artwork from my son with North Sydney, with a bear, established 1908. It really is top class, I'm sure you will agree. (laughs) I hope you will forgive a bit of gratuitous boasting there from me. Um, my analogy (laughs) that I want to draw is that, especially the last item, the the piece de resistance of of the bears there, uh, may be surprised to you that it wasn't original from my son. Uh, He copied it from a picture. He traced it out. He drew in the colors. He did something based on a pattern. Um, It's not perfect, I'm sure you'll agree, but it's recognizable uh, based on the original. What we have in this passage is a copy, a pattern, a tracing out of the original. We have the original read in this magisterial passage of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the supreme servant. This is what this letter is all about. This is what the Christian life is all about, our servant king. We thought about that last week. We thought about in this whole series the conquest of his gospel, the news that he is king. If you want to know what the gospel is, it's a kind of religious word. It's the announcement of momentous news that is universal in its significance. And specifically, it is summarized in just three words there in verse 11, just before our passage. In this case, four, Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the gospel. That's the momentous news. That's what Paul is doing, and these Philippians, who he calls his partners in the gospel, are all on about. It's the news that has significance for every single human being, that God has placed on the throne of heaven one called Jesus Christ. Jesus is Lord. He's God. He's the ultimate ruler. Verse 9, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's what Paul was on about. That's what the Philippians were on about. That's what Christians are on about. The news that this one, this Jesus is God's supreme king. And the response to that is what the Christian life is all about. We are going to look at Acts in our next series. You might remember the little corny phrase that I used or coined, Porphos, proclamation of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That's the gospel. Turn and you will be forgiven. Bow the knee now before we face Jesus in judgment. But the extraordinary surprise that we saw last week was how the great and exalted king gets there on the throne of all the universe, this Lord Jesus. He doesn't do it on a white charger, slaughtering all before him like other religious leaders. No, he does it as a servant. He humbles himself. We looked at that last week. He did not count equality with God, though he is God, something to be grasped, but he humbled himself, coming all the way down into this world as a man, and 
specifically and most poignantly and most movingly, he died. He was a servant who was obedient to death on a cross. He's a servant savior. He's sovereign because he served us. And his obedience as a servant has secured forgiveness to anybody who would receive it. That is what Paul is on about. That's what this letter is on about. That's what the Christian life is on about. But the question then is, so what? We've had this exalted, magnificent, actually probably a hymn originally about Jesus, the God of heaven, the eternal son who became a man who died as a servant and has been raised up as a servant king. So what? Well, it's here in our passage today. Verse 12, therefore, therefore, And what we have in these verses, verses 12 to 18, is the pattern that we are to follow, the tracing out, the filling in of us being servants in the pattern of the servant. That's what we're calling our series, Partners in the Servant's Pattern. How we as Christian people individually, but also as a church, as his people, his representatives, his ambassadors, his children are to echo, to trace out, to live out the pattern that he has first shown us. And Paul's aim in this passage is is to show us the life of the servant that we are to live out so that we can together advance this great project of being a light to the nations, a servant to the world, to draw others to him. And so my aim this morning is to pick out three things. There's so many things, but three things from this passage about what our servant life is to be like, what our echoing of the pattern of our servant king is to be involved with. The servant life, first, is committed, not casual. Second, distinctive, not indistinguishable. And thirdly, sacrificial, not self-preserving. So first, the servant life. You want to know what it is to be a Christian. It's to live as the servant. And the servant life, individually and together, is first committed, not casual. I wonder if you'd look with me to verse 12, please. Paul says, Therefore, my beloved, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, you see, there it is, obedience as a servant, following the servant, So now, not only as in my presence, he hopes to come to see them, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, it's important at this point for us to recognize that he's speaking to people who are already saved, saved from the judgment of God. That's clear in chapter 1, verse 28. You are those who are saved already. But the thing is that when you become a follower of Jesus... There are different stages of salvation. We're fully, utterly, completely safe. Die today as you walk out of this building. I'm sorry for such a morbid thought. But if you trust in Jesus, you are saved from the judgment of God. But the exciting thing is that the Christian life doesn't stay the same as at the beginning. God is at work in us. And God is calling us to work out our salvation. Some people talk about the three tenses of sin. I don't know if you've ever heard this. We have been, past tense, saved from the penalty of sin. No fear at all. Saved from the penalty of sin. One day we will be saved from the presence of sin. What a joyful day that will be. We will no longer be beleaguered by the sin of our own lives and those of others. But in the present, we are being saved from the power of sin. God is changing us to make us more like the servant. And what he says here is to work out your own salvation that you have with fear or reverence and trembling, or perhaps awe, with reverence and awe, with fear and trembling. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying, I think, At least in the first place, being a follower of Jesus, being a servant, is not something that you do just on weekends. It's a commitment. It's not casual. It's all of life. I lived in England, as many of you know, and some people speak of being C and E Christians, Christmas and Easter Christians. 
We know that's not right, but is it possible that we, even who are committed Christians, actually still segment our Christian lives into a particular part of our week or our ambitions or our goals and aims? No, God is saying it's all of life. It is my life. I am now a servant of Christ and a servant of every other person who lives around me. The goal, the aim, the focus of our lives is to trace out the pattern of the life of the servant for the sake of others, for their good, for their salvation, so that as many people as possible, those who are already believers and others who aren't yet, will be there on that day bowing the knee to Jesus, forgiven and like him. And so... Our lives are that. And may I say, there's no retirement in the Christian life. It's the one career that keeps on going to its peak until the end. You keep on becoming more and more and more like the servant. And that involves working it out ourselves. Verse 12, work out your own salvation with reverence and awe, with fear and trembling. That is to say, it requires effort. It requires concentration. Not that we're going to save ourselves. We're already saved. But to become more like Jesus. To put others ahead of ourselves. To have the mind of Christ. To advance his kingdom in the opportunities and the situation he's given us. I used to be very, very into a particular hobby in my life. Those who know me can probably guess what it was. It was a sport. But I have to ask myself, did I have the same dedication, focus, commitment, desire for my Christian life, for my service as a servant, as I did in that hobby at that time? What about ourselves? Is there something in our lives, a career, even family life, even the good things of this world that has a position that is too high up the ladder? No, every orb of our lives to be committed to being a servant, being like the one who gave himself for the salvation of others. And did you notice it is with fear and trembling, not the fear of being cast out, there's no doubt about that, but the appropriate reverence before the one that we know is true in verse 9 to 11, the one who is exalted, the one who is Lord, the one who each of us one day will meet face to face. Not to treat him as trifling or casual or someone we can dismiss. If you're a careful and sensitive reader at this point, you ought to be concerned because we know we can't do it ourselves. We are sinners. Every day each of us wakes up with desires, even involuntary desires, that are turned in on ourselves. One of the famous theologians, Augustine, spoke about sin as being curved in on yourself, self-focused, instead of other person and God-focused, as we were made to be. We are born with those desires. They still remain with us. And alone, we cannot do anything about it. But, did you notice, verse 13, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The number of people who are on the life course, I'm so excited about that. This is a a five-week basic introduction to life with Jesus. And some will be there, I'm sure, who are wondering at this point in the course, I can see it's true, but can I do it? It seems so radical to give my life to Christ, to follow him. I don't have the energy or the strength or the resources within. And the answer is you're absolutely right if that's what you're thinking. But verse 13, For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It's not divine sovereignty and our responsibility as opposites, but together at the same time. It's not 50% God and 50% us, but 100% God and 100% us. That is to say, we can't give our lives for the sake of others, in service of others. We're turned in on ourselves. 
But God comes to live in us when we turn to Christ. We have the mind of Christ. The Spirit dwells in us. And God is powerfully at work. God, the creator of the universe, is at work in each of our hearts. Every individual soul here this morning. How new a Christian you might be. But he is at work in you, turning your heart to will. That is to want and to work for his good pleasure. Like a compass. I don't know if you have this experience. We go off piste every day. And yet his spirit is at work directing us back to want to please him. Deep down, because of the work of the spirit, we want to please him. Despite the battle that we face within. He is at work in us to will. That is to want what is right, what is the servant life. But also to work. That is to give us the energy. To give us the resources. To give us all that we need to please him. What is his good pleasure that he is at work in us to produce? Well, it's surely what we saw at the end of the previous passage. It's the glory of God that everything would be put right, that every knee would bow, that every tongue would confess. Our work in this life is to be a servant for the sake of others, that they might bow more and more to the glory of God the Father. So in the first place, the servant life individually and together is committed, not casual. But secondly, it is also distinctive, not indistinguishable. Distinctive, not indistinguishable. Look with me, please, to verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. I've never been out to western New South Wales, but I'm told that if you go out there camping and you're out there at night, it is pitch black without any street lights or city lights except the dazzling sun, uh, stars. (laughs) I was told this morning at the 8 o'clock that actually Palm Beach, if you want to go a little bit closer, has been designated as a dark spot or a dark zone which has the same effect. But that is the picture that we have here. In the midst of darkness, in a crooked and twisted generation, the people of God, us individually, us together, are to be a light in the darkness. That is our purpose, to be distinctive, not indistinguishable. And it is a crooked and twisted generation. There might have been a time in the past where I had to persuade you of that. But we don't need persuading. Our world, and us by nature, is turned in on itself. It's crooked. It's bent away from God and his purposes. It's twisted like a gnarled old tree, twisted in on itself and diseased. It gleams outwardly, but inwardly, in the heart, behind the doors, all manner of crookedness and twistedness. And yet, as a beaming light in the midst of it, in the midst of the darkness, are these flashing lights, individual believers in Jesus Christ who have been turned, a church that beams out a life that is different and radical and driven by love. And that is who we are to be. And that is who Israel was to be. In fact, this few verses here, verses 14 to 15, are full of the background of the Old Testament. Israel was meant to be a servant, according to the prophet Isaiah. A servant and a light to the nations. They were meant to show everyone what it was like to live with God as God to all the world around. But as you read the prophet Isaiah, you discover that the servant was a blind servant who had turned his back on God. In fact, one that had turned and become a crooked and twisted generation. But in Isaiah's prophecy, we then read of a new servant, the servant who would come, the servant of God, who would become the light to the nations, who would give himself in sacrifice to be that distinctive difference. And that is Jesus. And now, as those who are in him, as his servants, we are to be his 
children, the children of God, verse 15, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, who are to be the light, who are to fulfill the goal and the purpose of the nation of Israel, to be a light in the darkness. And we do that, verse 16, holding fast to the word of life. What we've been listening to in the scriptures is the word of life. It's the source of life. It's the word that gives life. It's what we have that we want to hold fast to, grip on strongly, give ourselves to, because that's the source of the power of the change of our hearts, to will and to work for his good pleasure, to be the light in the darkness. But that phrase there also has the sense of holding out the word of life. In the old KJV, the King James Version, it says holding forth the word of life. That is to say, with both life and lip, individually and as God's people here, St. Thomas's, we are to be a light to the nations. That's what we've been saved for, with the word of life, with the word about Jesus, the gospel which changes people's eternal futures. And as we draw to a close, it's interesting what it is specifically of all the things that Paul could identify as the marker and the thing of distinctiveness and difference that makes us like the servant. What is it? It Surprise me. I don't know if it surprises you. It's there in verse 14. Do all things without grumbling or arguing. (laughs) Isn't that striking? Of all the things to be like the servant, to be the light of the world, don't grumble, don't complain, don't argue, don't dispute. And isn't that Israel? The grumblers in the wilderness, the disputes and the debates, the anger with Moses. Why couldn't we stay in Egypt? And every time they grumbled, every time they disputed, they halted, they stopped traveling forward. But now we as the people of God are to be different, the children of God, with the Father as our Father, to be those who don't grumble but give lives of gratitude. That's what's going on in the end of our passage. Verse 18, be glad and rejoice. Replace your grumbling with gratitude. And as we do that, we surge forward. We draw together. We become the light in the midst of the darkness. We hold out the word that gives life. And what a challenge that is. Grumbling, which is a vertical problem, which displays the fact that in our hearts we don't recognize how God has been so good to us. I had a friend, she died some years ago, but towards the end of her life she would begin every day with ten things that she, she, she could give gratitude and thanks to God for. The Christian life is, above all things, a life of thanks because of who God is and what he's done for us. Gratitude, not grumbling, but also not just vertically, horizontally, arguing. And this is so poignant to this letter, this letter which calls us to humble ourselves, not to stand on our rights, but to go forward to others in asking for forgiveness, to receive others' forgiveness, so that we together can be united and keep going forward and keep on being that light. God's call to us and the challenge to us each this morning, I think, is very specifically about verse 14. What is it going to be for us to be the servant light here in North Sydney, for us to be the servant in our families, in our own situation? It's to turn our grumbling into gratitude. It's to turn our arguing into peace and grace with one another. Our speech, how we speak about one another, what we say to each other, is so vitally important for the great project about which God has given us. The servant life for us St. Thomas's and for us individually is one of commitment, not being casual. It's one which involves being distinctive, not indistinguishable, but thirdly and finally, one which is sacrificial and not self-preserving. The Apostle Paul doesn't just talk the talk, he walks the walk. Verse 16, towards the end, 
that I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. You see, Paul is himself a model of the servant life. He's one who doesn't just say it, but lives it. He pours his life out like a drink offering to the point of death. He doesn't self-preserve. He doesn't think about his own rights and his own energies and his own limitations. He gives himself out in all spheres of his life for the good, for the salvation of these dear Philippians and for all others who don't yet know Christ. That is the true Christian life. And he does it, verse 17, for your faith. It could all equally be translated, the sacrificial offering for your faith, for your upbuilding, for your strengthening. And the result at the end is joy. I am glad and I rejoice with you all. And likewise, you should be glad and rejoice with me. Here is the countercultural, unbelievable, divine, yet humanly impossible dynamic. As human beings give ourselves to being like God, serving others and serving Him, the result is not misery, it's joy. Right from the beginning, the devil whispers in our ears, look after self and you'll be happy. Put self first, that's the route to joy. But God says the truth. Give yourself in service of others for the salvation of others, not what they want, what is best for people. And as you do that, that is the source, that is the secret, that is the formula for true joy. Servants in the servant's pattern. That's who we are. We began with the bears, but actually we have something much greater to trace out. It's the life, it's the pattern, it's the beauty, the light of Christ. And our servant life, St. Thomas's, individually and together, is to be one of commitment, not casualness. To be distinctive, not indistinguishable, and to be sacrificial, not self-preserving. All to the glory of God. All for our joy. Let's pray. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. We praise and thank you, Father, that you call us to something that you work in us by your own power. We thank you that you call us to something which is for our good and for your glory. And we praise you that this morning we have so much to thank you for as your servant people. Make us more and more the light in the darkness. Amen.